Okay, so I think let me get started because we've got a little bit of an introduction that we have for our students. And then hopefully by that time, Dr. Foyun has joined. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Morgan. With me is Basit Sana. I also have Mr. Theo Basset Notes and Mr. Lloyd Bemelman. Good evening, Morgan. Professional sports psychology. Great. So I'm hoping that everyone's doing great. So tonight we are going to discuss honors applications. We'll go into sports psychology, a little bit more information about the field. And then we've got some fun info of the field, like firsthand experience from Dr. Fuyun, Mr. Besedino, Mr. Bemelman. Our Q and A session at the end. So honors applications. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you all have already applied for UP. I hope so, because our applications open the first of April. I'm pretty sure everyone's very familiar with our program requirements. Um, so I'm not going to like read into everything. The slides will be posted afterwards. Um, for you to look at. We also have the different modules that he offers. So please don't think that each varsity has a standard set of modules. There's a lot of different things that you can choose from, a lot of different fields um, that you can go into. And your, your varsity that you choose is your make or break point because those, those are the modules that you're going to be learning. So next we've got VITS. They open the 1st of June. Also their requirements, their modules. Next one, please. UJ, 1st of July, so they're a little bit later. During our supplementary exams at UP. And then also we've got UCT, they open the 1st of April. Their modules, um, I think Tamron, our, the, the Psyche EC member that created these slides, she couldn't find the requirements for UCT, but I am pretty sure that they need a basic requirement of a upper second class pass for UCT. I'm not sure what that would be for UCT, but that requirements in obviously psychology modules. Financing options. So if you go onto each website of the each varsity website, you'll find a very handy layout of all of their fees. If you want to have a little bit more research about bursaries, loans, um, scholarships, internships, fellowships, that sort of thing, you can go on to zabursaries.coza, student loans, that's where you'll find student loans, but you can also find a very extensive list of bursaries. All of the information, all the links is available there. And then, yeah, there's just a few of the bursaries that was listed. Anyway, on to sports psychology, the main event tonight. Okay, so sports psychology, I'm not going to be like our psychology lecturers and read all of this to you. So I'm pretty sure you can either take a screenshot or view these slides later. But sports psychology, the one is that it is not a recognized field under the HPCSA. So that's the Health Professionals Council of South Africa. If you want to go into sports psychology, you need your license of being either a clinical or counseling psychologist, just so that you can legally practice. And obviously your, I don't want to say specialization, but your interest and main focus will be around sport. Obviously, our professionals will give you a little bit more detail about that. I'm pretty sure we all know what sport is, so I don't need to describe that to you. Potential duties and career paths, I'm pretty sure that you can 
get the general layout from that slide. I'm not going to read it to you because we're not in a psychology lecture at this point in time. And then our professionals will definitely be telling you a little bit more. So yeah. Okay, on to presentations from our, uh, Mr. Poseidon, did load shedding just hit you? No, I just like sitting in the dark, Morgan. Because you went dark. Yeah, it's going to come back on just now. Sorry, it's load shedding here at uh, HPC. Ah, okay. That's great. So is Dr. Fulyun here yet? It uh, doesn't seem like it. Um, this is a problem. Or did I just speak too fast? No, I think you said six o'clock, didn't you? Yeah. Let me message Tamron. Okay, sorry about that. Obviously, you can only take a horse to the water, you can't make him drink. And we also don't have any emails from him. So I think let's carry on and then when he shows up, he shows up. Well, Morgan, Kraling is a rower, so I don't know whether you can take the water, the rower to water, whether they'll row, but yeah, that's. Uh... That's Kraling's background. Oh, okay, but that's fine. We'll we'll just carry on, and you can jump the boat when he gets here. Perfect. So then, let's go over to Mr. Bemelman. I yes. don't know yeah. if you have a presentation that you'd like to share. Um. No, I said I'd just uh, verbalize. Um. The the thing um, is, it have you started the event? Because um, you you have the the slideshow done, don't you? Um. Yeah. Okay. Um, Carry on. <clears throat> well, yeah. Okay. So just we'll just have to see when uh, Doctor Full okay. Unit. Okay. Yeah, sorry. And <laughs> then just take, take, yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to link up Dr. Balloon. Just hold on, we're having some okay. problems with the, with the connection and so on. I'm gonna get him to come and sit here. Okay, okay great. Sorry. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Bemelman. No, no problem at all. Connection. I think just to mention to our UP students that are present here, if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat box. And then when we get to the Q&A session, we'll touch on all of those questions in case you feel like you're going to forget them or whatever, you can just add them there. Hello, Tamlin. You guys are such a rowdy crowd. You guys are really making a lot of noise. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Fulyun. Yes, I'm here. Finally, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a few minutes late. I don't even stress about it. We all know connection issues are a bit of a hassle. Oh, it's not Tamlin. Who are you? You are... So, so I am Morgan. I am also on the Psyche EC. Yes. I will be running 
tonight. She she's occupied in the counseling side, I th I think. Um, so I will be running tonight. With me is my colleague Basitsana. She is our she's running all of our technical things tonight. So hopefully okay. we don't have issues there. So we have done inter inter the introduction introduction. Yes, there we go. So that was basically just quite a whole lot of information for our students. That was about our honors applications and a little about just the, the basics about everything. So we are very much prepared to hear whatever you have brought for us tonight. So if you would like to take it away, the floor is definitely yours from here on. Okay, good. Thank you. I've uh, prepared a short presentation. Let me try just to get it on the screen here quickly. Um, right, so uh, there we go. Uh, can I can I just far away? Yeah, by all means. Good. Thank you. So I'm going to talk briefly on, on becoming a sports psychologist. So let me start with uh, a basic um, uh, sports psychology principle, and that is being process orientated. Now, if we um, uh, let me just. Uh, Just a second, yeah. Right. If we look at these two um, Olympic athletes, gold medalists, uh, um, Eliot Kipchoge and our own Tatiana Schumacher, uh, one can we can talk and think a lot about what what they do and how they participate. The incredible focus that Eliot has and the, the um, ability for uh, Tatiana to perform under pressure. Um, so we can we can think uh, about champions and and what they do when they're actually competing, but what we don't that often think is about is how did they start, so where did they come from and what was the process that they followed to become Olympians or Olympic medal winners, so it is the process of becoming. That is in sport what we, and in particular in sports psychology, and maybe also for tonight, the talk that we are interested in is the process of becoming. So if you, um, a, a champion, and uh, you know, a lot of research has been done also in sports psychology and what champions actually do and how they think and how they participate, but not a lot has, has been done about the history of how they actually become champions, what happens in the history. So uh, we can say you are, you, you know, sports psychologist. You you would like to become sports psychologist. Um, uh, let me just my screen is doing something funny here. Um, but you are currently in an undergraduate position, or you you in the starting blocks. And what is the process of becoming a sports psychologist? So that is uh, what my talk is going to focus on. Let me give you a bit of a background on, on my journey and becoming a sports psychologist. And I've, I've, I've been a, you know, in sports psychology for, for about more than 25 years. So it's been quite a while. It's only halfway through varsity that I really started to become a sports psychologist or a psychologist, not a sports psychologist, a psychologist. So I started with my master's when I was 28 years old and the PhD much later. So if you think you don't have time, maybe you do have time. Um, then I've always been involved in sport and sport development and uh, um, as an administrator from student uh, on student level, as you are involved in the Psyche Society. And um, so I've been involved in sport and the sport club and later on provincial, uh, provincial level. I've managed teams overseas uh, to World Cups and World Championships. Uh, the third one there is Max Steel Maestro. That was a program that um, for athletes with uh, high potential, but uh, who did not have the um, necessary resources to reach their potential. So it's mostly juniors and in the transitional period to becoming uh, senior athletes. And I was involved as a mentor and, and it was 
particularly through that program that I got involved through the Olympic teams as a psychologist in the 2000s. And then the other thing that I've always done is to build networks with coaches and sports administrators and so on. Then I also come from a competitive sports background. Uh, as a junior, I was in five provincial sports. Uh, and as a senior, I competed in the national um, canoeing team for, for about nine years. And I was a captain of that team. But becoming a sports psychologist, let me emphasize this, that I don't think it's necessary to have competed uh, at necessarily a high level, I think you should be, uh, you should have, comp you know, have participated in competitive sport, but not necessarily at the highest level. So I do not want to emphasize that as a, you know, as a necessary step, because that is not always feasible. Then I've always had an interest in sport and in sport performance. And I remember that as an early age that I, as you know, during that period of being in the national team, I started working on my own program, sourcing programs for overseas, from overseas, uh, special interest in nutrition. This was before all this, the, the real supplements started coming in and the nutrition started becoming a big thing in sport. An academic from the Free State University, he wrote um, an article on nutrition. I wrote to him when I was 18 years old, and he wrote back to me. I was quite surprised. And those were in the days where you had to post your letters. So he actually wrote back to me, and I was very pleased about that. Then just a, 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 a brief encounter or, or brief um, uh, interesting experience or what I can remember, the cyclist that you see there, is Pedro Delgado, his nickname was um, Pequiro. And he was a very excited cyclist, but the one particular Tour de France that I watched, and it was 1986. Now that was in my young days and way before you were all born. That was, um, they showed it on highlights on TV and, and he was a favorite for the Tour de France. And on one of this, uh, in, in one of the stages in the Alps, he was lying fourth at that stage. You know, was, he was uh, he was a climber, so he was he was uh, going for a podium uh, in the in the general classifications. But halfway through the stage, on one of the climbs, he, he um, got off his bike, bicycle, literally threw it down, and then abandoned the race. Now, afterwards, when he made the um, uh, press at the press conference, they asked him, you know, obviously had to say what happened. And he said what very few, few people knew, knew is that his mother died in the first week of the tour. And he said, I did not have the energy to fight the pain. I was defeated. Now, what was the energy he talked about? And it was... Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it was emotional energy, but those th th that was what I realized, okay, but now yeah, there's physical energy and there's emotional energy, which is quite, until today, that's quite an important part of my, my, my psychological thinking when I deal with sport. I am started a bit later, so I'm rushing a bit because I don't want to hold up Theo and um, Lloyd with their talks, I know they're coming after me. Then just uh, working as a sports psychologist, the first part, it's never been a, the, 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 the biggest part of my uh, practice. Early on, 10%, maybe at the peak, 30 to 40%. Um, but what I particularly enjoy about sports psychology, I think, is a positive environment in contrast with the clinical psychology that I do. So it is, uh, you know, it's positive people that want to improve. The nature of the work is about improving, getting better. You get to see places. I've been to interesting places as a sports psychologist, not just as a, as a, as a, as a um, athlete, but as a psychologist. You know, slept in tent in Zambia, working with the Zambian polo cross team, which is a fascinating sport. And, uh, working with a variety and diversity of sports, so that is one of the particular of the things that I really enjoy with a, with a uh, um, um, sports psychology. Um, some of the disadvantages or the cons it makes it's difficult to make a good living in South Africa doing exclusively sport of performance psychology. Now maybe Theo and Lloyd can also comment on that, and it tends to be seasonal, you know following the, the, the sporting calendar after World Champs in August and September, it's usually quiet and then until January, then it starts picking up again. 
You, it changes if you're involved with teams, when management of the teams changes, coaches, then everything changes. Uh, irregular hours for some, it's not a problem. You know, later on, maybe that would become a problem. But there are actually few kinds. It's a very positive uh, environment. Some of the experiences of practice that I just, three things that I want to mention is that um, Overthinking is one something that I often hear what athletes do. Now, what overthinking does in sport, it raises the level of anxiety, it slows down movement um, and, and decision making. Expectations are often too high and unrealistic, and that is not what champions do. Then in improving performance, it's not just about skills, but it's also what I call optic, obstacle removal, and that is really to get the, the athlete in a good personal space. Uh, so that they can perform. Uh, so that could be, you know, relationship problems or any other thing that can get in the way, like like Delgado had. Um, then some advice on be how to become a sports psychologist. Um, first, I think you have to define your goal. Do you want to be a psychologist first doing sports psychology? That's what I'm doing. Uh, or do you want to be a sports psychologist or a mental performance coach? And maybe I know many others have followed that that route. Maybe, you know, um, uh, and I'll combine this with another point. And so, if you if you the, what you set your goal as, you maybe you will you will follow a different path. If you choose to be a psychologist first, then you must do try and do to, just to get into masters, whatever is necessary to get into masters and not necessarily as a sports psychologist, but as a psychologist. Then you, I think you have to have a real interest in sport and in the psychology of performance. So observe, follow, formulate your own theories and so on. Start with what the coach brings, also in marketing, find uh, you know, your own frame of reference with what you think you want to teach them Start with what they bring or what you uh, what they want you to do. Learn from others in the sporting industry, not just from other sports psychologists, but but like somebody like Ross Tucker, who's an exercise physiologist. But he has an incredible. He writes very well, so academically, but also just for in layman terms. So I think that's a particular field. So he. Uh, um, he works uh, for the World Rugby Association as a, but I think uh, one can learn also how others do it that work in the sports industry, not necessarily on the management side, but more on the specialist side. Then I think active participation in sport and administration is an advantage. Uh, and very importantly, build your networks in the sport industry with coaches and also with parents. It's often the parents that bring the and support the, the athletes even after school. Um, and and uh, they would encourage the athletes um, then to, to also see a sports psychologist. Uh, and that is what I have. So sport is uh, sports psychology is another way for me of living my passion for sport. Thank you very much, Morgan. I hope I haven't gone too much over my allocated time. I have a few minutes, but thank you very much. Oh, I... so that was a beautiful presentation, and I'm pretty sure I, for one, learned something new. So I hope everyone else did. So next we have Mr. Bemelman to take over after Dr. Foyun. So Mr. Bemelman, you can take it away. Good. Well, thank you <clears throat> very much for having me this evening. Um, it's quite necessary to build on the, the information offered by Dr. Fu Yun, um, as then it will create a bit more of a cohesive unit to offer like-minded advice to the listeners. Um, so yes, I think that um, to do anything in life, really, you have to be good at it. So whether you're going into law or you're studying in another subject, you you have to be very effective. Okay. So whether you you're going into sports psychology and you you want to just find a job that pays a nine to five, um, I don't personally think you're going to find that in sports psychology. So you have to be incredibly passionate for it and enjoy. Uh, the 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 sporting aspect of it, and it that certainly does help to having 
done it yourself or continue to do it yourself. Um, I uh, exercise regularly and compete um, with a few sporting codes. Um, so yeah, that's that's right. Um, so I think the 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 big argument is whether you can sustain yourself as a as a sports psychologist and um, I'm certainly doing that at the moment. It's it's not easy, to be honest. Um, it's it's not the the luxurious life that you you think people lead. Um, I always look to the the United States to look at their example of, because they have the most sports psychologists um, in the country, and um, they they I think in the the Olympics maybe around. Uh, 2004, they, they sent uh, about three. 2012, they had as much as 12, 12 psychologists in 2012, and um, they, they just keep adding. Obviously, they've got a far larger team that they need people to, to go to and to, to see, so the, the need is there for them to increase their amount, and I think there's a, there's a company called Premier Sports Psychology in the U.S., and they've, I think it's got over 25 employees. Um, so I think it's it's great to look that way and uh, to aspire to the to the US. But this is South Africa, and we have to apply to a South African perspective. Um, and it's it's very small, you know, uh, sports psychology in South Africa. It's the there's not a lot of information. There's no master's program on it. And um, I studied my. Uh, masters overseas in Ireland, and uh, I find that the population, uh, but that's that you do study. It's it's not clinical. It's not counselling. So um, I think the the clinical and counselling largely refers to the 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 APA, um, and that's it's the the DSM five. Not the APA. APA is a referencing style. Um, it's uh, the the DSM five, and it's a uh, it's a it's a manual of mental disorders, and athletes I personally don't find have mental disorders. So um, the if 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 that does happen, then you I have to refer them, and I can't see them any further. And it's 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 more a case of a person would struggle to get out of bed in the morning uh, instead of um, struggling to to find motivation to finish their workout. Um, so, so that's right. I think the in America the the money is very good for sports psychologists. You, um, they say around uh, an entry level university working sports psychologist, you can earn over. Uh, that they, they said uh, seventy thousand dollars a year, which is over a million rand here. Uh, so the I I can tell you now, I definitely do not make that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it should come as any surprise. <laughs> um, I think in South Africa, if if you can make it into uh, clinical and counselling psychology, I, I think that would be the 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 um, the route to go to get more money. Because um, uh, I think money is the the ground you stand on, and everyone wants more of it, but. Um, it, it's you have to remember it doesn't create past, uh, happiness. So if yeah, it's not always believable, but it's true. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's the case. And yeah, there's there's also a lot of jobs in South Africa that you can do uh, to be effective uh, overseas. The the people have more than uh, one degree in many fields, so they'll have people might go back and do a second undergraduate or a second honours in a different um, field just to get more experience while while they're working, while they're studying, they'll take on two. Um, whereas here we just we just qualify, you get the undergrad, the honours, the masters, and you go into the job and then that's what you are for the rest of your life. Whereas it's it's largely variable. You you can change what you want to do as you go along. And you, you um, I think myself as well, I, I, I found myself one day as a sports administrator 
um, at a, a private school running their sports program. And I thought, let's just click on the computer, just Google a bit and see where this takes me. And um, the, I think I remember uh, in my heart, uh, in my head saying that you must uh, run fearlessly in pursuit of what sets your whole, your soul on fire. I think that was what I remember thinking to myself. And I applied for this course overseas and um, with with a lot of luck I got in. Uh, and yeah, well, not, not luck. I, I deserved it and I qualified and it was fantastic. But yeah, so I think you, you have to be good, you know, if you if you um, the best, if you're going into NBA level, um, you'll earn upwards towards two two million rand um, in in American money. That's not really our money. Um, we we have a far lower um, currency compared to that. But yes, um, I think relevant um, other fields is also exercise psychology and executive coaching. So exercise psychology is it's for not only athletes, but uh, general people going to the gym. I think it's a, a large market and executive coaching. Um, it's it's just people at the end of the day, whether you ride a bike or you uh, sit behind a desk and you're still uh, dealing with communication and with people. So um, the the athlete and the the culture doesn't de determine the person i think as a psychologist always look at the person behind the the um, sporting code and they consult them first um as i'm sure many psychologists or undergrads would would know it um yeah so i think there's there's a lot in that there's um overseas there's a lot people have to exercise governments pay a lot of money to people who can get the nation um exercising um ireland has got a ride to work program they build bicycle lanes they you um i think two or three thousand euros off of your tax money you can claim you can go buy a bicycle for free uh, process it on your tax return and um then you can ride to work and it's a government sponsored ride to work uh, scheme because at the end of the day, if they have more fit people that are healthier, they pay less in uh, hospital bills because they have state sponsored medical aid. But it obviously doesn't apply here, but you can. It, it's the same subject. It's still sports psychology and it's it's exercise psychology and the two are very, very similar. So there's Look, there's a mountain, there's about 20 subjects and 20 fields of of work you can go into with the with the sports psychology degree. So I think it's it's extremely beneficial to go into into your honors and get that get that honors uh, because it's a it's a hell of a course. I think there's there's about 300 people um, applying for the course and I think only about 80 get in. So I think part of being exceptional and being good at what you do is getting the best marks possible and then obviously the, you take the, the best candidates um <clears throat> yeah i think that's that's basically the the sum of of what i have to present um now that there's enough time for uh theo to present as well give him a fair chance oh. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Bimmerman. Um, so, Mr. Besedinut, we will proceed with our interview style presentation. Are you still okay? Very, very happy with that, Morgan. No, no problem. I just uh, want to say hi to Kraling. I haven't spoken to him in ages and we didn't get a chance to greet. So, everything good? Yeah, like a good donkey. All good. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yep. Hi, Lloyd. Hello, how are you? Ready, uh, ready when you are, Morgan. Great. Okay, so it's now your turn to sell psychology to us. Uh, so give us a little bit more info about your path to how you became a sports psychologist. 
I, I first have to use a page out of Lloyd's book. If you're not, if you're not passionate, then we're not going to sell psychology to you. Um, the, the, the honors, the honor students you have to be passionate about and you want to make it, you, you want to have to make it your life. We, we're not going to sell psychology to you. And, and I think I can speak for Kreiling and Lloyd when, when I say that, but no, Morgan, thank, thank you very much. And, um, you know, when, when you gave me the, the opportunity to speak tonight, you know, I, I think in a situation like this, you, you always, you always go back in the, in the archives of, of your memory and you want to dust things off. And, and the first piece of advice uh, that I want to give straight off the bat. I, I don't know. I, I think Lloyd, you'll you'll probably remember this Doc Gretny of Doc Oedi song but there's a there's a song from the 90s. Um, it's not actually a song. It's just the guy speaking, and he was actually the the director of the movie. I, I think he did Moulin Rouge, if I'm not mistaken, a guy by the name of Baz Luhrmann, and and the song the song is basically some some life advice, and it, it's actually referred to as the sunscreen song because the first line starts with uh, where if, if I can give you one piece of advice for the future, it's wear sunscreen. And if you want to become a sports psychologist, I, I think a lot of people uh, should, should take some of that advice and, and start wearing sunscreen a lot earlier in their life. But I, I want to read you a small passage when it comes to my, to my advice. And, and I've highlighted it here for myself. So just give me two seconds. Um, so he, he says the next thing, be careful whose advice you buy, but be patient with those who supply it. Advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it is a way of fishing the past from the disposal, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts, and recycling it for more than it's worth. So, so if everybody on the call tonight can can bear with me for fishing my old memories out of the the garbage recycle and dusting them off for something more uh, more valuable than it, what it probably is, is that that that's all I'm going to try and do tonight. So. Um, Number one, you, you're all probably very much in a phase of trying to work out what perspective you, you're going to work from in, in your professional lives. And, and Kreiling uh, highlighted some, some very important information there, um, as did Lloyd. You know, I think you've, you've got to pick, you've got to pick a, a perspective from where you work and where you stand. And I, I was trained narratively. I don't, I don't work that narratively anymore. Um, but I, I wanted to share one or two stories with you tonight more than doing a presentation because, number one, I'm not particularly good at presentations. And secondly, I, I speak a little bit more naturally when I'm, I'm, I'm interviewed as such. But um, the, the first story, and, and I think it touches on both what the previous two gentlemen did say, is, is about having a passion and having a link to sports psychology. I, I actually, uh, I never picked sports psychology. Um, it actually picked me. I was a, I was a, a provincial cricketer and hockey player when I was about 16 years old. Um, I didn't compete at the same level as, as Doc, but um, and I went through a bit of a rough patch with my sport, and friends of my parents actually uh, referred us to a, a sports psychologist by the name of Professor Ben Stein, who eventually became one of my, my mentors, Doc Kraling will know him very well. And um, I went to go and see Professor Stein, and, and I left the session, and, and I left the session, I said, well, th this is what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know I don't know exactly what, what the reason was for that um, or why it, it tickled me so much. But I think what hit me very hard was, and if I think about it in, re in retrospect, was that, that you didn't have to be this, this physical beast or this brute of a human being or this talented sportsman to get the best out of yourself. You could actually also use your mind. And I think in retrospect, that, that is the one thing that stuck out for me. So from, from there on, um, and, and Lloyd used the word luck. I, yeah. I think like, like with all sport, you have, to be, you have to be bloody good and effective, like he said. But you also have to have those lucky breaks here and there, which, which I got more, more of than I think other people. And, and I'll touch around on a selection a little bit later. But um, by, by hook or by crook, I, I got through uh, master selection and, um, and, and I, I got an opportunity in golf. It's pretty much what I do with my life every day. So, so not only working in the sports psychology side, but working very particularly in golf. And only the last few years have I really branched out in, into other sports. Um, but but that, that's basically my history. So it, it, it really is just to get an opportunity and, and to run with it. Um, but, but linking back to what Kreiling and, and Lloyd both said, it, it's to have a passion for psychology, have a passion for people and have a passion for sport. And that, that can take you very far. Oh no, that I definitely agree with that. I mean, can I can I send my dad over to you because he's a good golf player, and I think some days I don't think we realize how much your mindset really has an impact on 
your sport and how you play sport and how you excel in it. It definitely does play a part. So, so since you're into the golf and you're going into all of these different other sports, give us your typical day. Like, what do you do? Do you just play a round of golf every day or do you converse with some people? <laughs> give us the, the rundown. The the irony of our work, Morgan, is that the, the, the better you get at this job, and I'd like to think that the three of us are pretty adept at what we're doing, the, the less chance you get to do the things that you would normally do or, or compete in. So the irony of this is I haven't played a round of golf in nearly seven years, and I spend nearly every day of my life uh, on, on a golf course. Um, but, but jokes aside, so a, a typical day in the life would, would be spending some time, whether that be... Uh, at a golf course on a driving range with with my clients outside um, one of the things that that we did in, in my master's years and, and something which which I couldn't figure out to, to start with but something that stood me in good stead later in, in my professional life um, was that that I actually got to spend time with athletes outside it wasn't just sitting in, in our and and what Lloyd referred to earlier as there the being no uh, master's course at this stage we, we actually my, my group of master's students we were fortunate enough to do such a course at the University of Pretoria actually our master's and, and unfortunately that's died out so he's 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 100% right and and it, and it is very very tough for people to break into the industry uh, b- because of that there, there is no such existing course anymore at the University of Pretoria which is particularly sad so he's 100% right when he says that but um, my my thesis leader at that stage a guy by the name of Professor Lawrence Heman um, actually forced us to sit at swimming practice at the University of Pretoria um, and to watch these these little kids swim up and down. And for the first month, I, I just couldn't figure out what the hell he wanted me to do with my future with watching swimmers. I mean, I don't know if you've ever watched people swimming, but it's it's not the most exciting, exciting thing in the world. But uh, after a month of doing this, the athletes had actually seen us being to training at half past five and quarter to six in the morning. And and I think it really it really got us over the line in terms of gaining their trust. So uh, getting back to my typical day, I'll, I'll spend time with athletes uh, on the driving range at the swimming pool, uh, like Kraling also said, with with coaches. I think that is an unbelievably important aspect of, of our job because if, if you can link up with coaches and you understand the coaching mindset um, and, and you understand what they need and want from you, you've already kind of won two-thirds of the battle. Um, but like I said, spending time on the range, uh, spending time on the putting green with players, the golf course, and, and then also obviously office work. Uh, the the part that I struggle with um, often is is the admin side. You know, there's I, I often joke. Um, you know, I think as as let, let's call ourselves uh, performance psychologists, but as as counseling psychologists and psychologists that kind of straddle two areas in terms of the the let's call it the professional psychology and then the sports psychology. We almost have the worst of both because in in our in our area and, and in our world. Um, we, we're not seen as real psychologists. My brother-in-law always jokes about me. He says, you know, we have a psychologist in the family. He's just unfortunately not a real psychologist. Um, but but we, we, we definitely have to, we have to straddle the world of being ethical, um, you know, looking after the, the health professions council guidelines like we are supposed to. Um, but then often we're also expected to, to treat athletes and behave in ways that, that aren't necessarily ethical according to, to professional guidelines. So, um, give you an example, a, a guy by the name of Robert Mitterfer, who's, who's one of the top psychologists in America, um, he, he would refer to the 20 minute in the back of the bus session. And, and what, what he would refer to, he actually wrote an article about that, was that, you know, you, you as, a, as a performance psychologist or sports psychologist, sometimes traveling and touring with the team, like, like Doc Kraling said, sometimes you have to be comfortable with doing a session when a guy's walked off a course or girls walked off a golf course and they're having a meltdown right there, and you've effectively got a, to do a session. Now, if, if you talk to the, to the clinical and the counseling psychologist out there, they'd absolutely flip out when you tell them that, listen, I'm trying to, make a, trying to do a therapeutic intervention in the bus on the way back home to the hotel. That is sometimes, unfortunately, the, the world that we live in. So I, I do sometimes find straddling the, those two worlds of professional psychology and having your HPCSA qualification and writing the boards and all of those things, but also operating in a very informal world of, of sports psychology or performance psychology, that, that can be tough. So that is a challenge that we have in our, in our day-to-day lives as well. Oh, yeah. So, so it definitely sounds like there's quite a bit of 
balance in there. So behind your administration issues and um, the, I always want to call it psychology with no borders. Normal, normal counseling room. So you don't really have that box that's putting you in. What would you say were some pros about sports psychology? The fact that you get to put on sunscreen and your colleagues don't is number one. No, joke, joke, jokes aside, Morgan, I, I, I think, and, and Doc Crayling touched on it, um, Lloyd touched on it as well, the, the population you work with is, is a lot of fun. Um, it's definitely challenging because, and, and, you know, knowing these two gentlemen and the work that they do, um, I, I think one of the, one of the greatest um, advantages of dealing in the world that we work in and there's a, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bob Rotella. He's a, he's a very well-known sports psychologist in America, but also a very well-known uh, psychologist in the world of golf. And, and he referred to the fact that he gets to develop people or helps to develop people to the point where they're better than even what they thought they could be. You know, and, and, and really seeing somebody's dreams come true or, or win, win the medal or achieve the goal that, that they set out to achieve and helping along that journey, we, we are just guides, you know, we, we don't get them there, we don't, uh, we, we're not the cause of it, they still have to go and hit the ball, or go and sink the putt, or, you know, go and go and ride the race, but, but we're just trying to help with that, but, but that is a, that's a huge pro. Um, I think the, the other side to it is, is you build, you build unbelievable relationships in the world of sport, um, whether it be with coaches, or, or parents, or athletes, and, and they, they, um, relationships that stay with you forever you know i uh, i just look at, at at lloyd's office there and 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 we're all guilty of it and i say guilty and I'm, I'm not even ashamed of it we all have have mementos from people that have done well that we've worked with you know whether it be a jersey or uh, or something that they've signed for us or, or something you know we we all we are all sports fans and and there's nothing there's nothing better than seeing a, a sports person that you have had a, a direct input with actually perform um, and, and live up to their own expectations, which is something m marvelous to, to be part of and, and to help them achieve. That, that's great. It sounds like a very, very reward. Not, not just on a materialistic level, but I think emotionally as well, especially when you make those breakthroughs. So now I want us to like rewind back to your cobweb memories. So what is something that you wish you knew before you entered this field? Like any, anything that you wish you knew that could possibly be some dire advice for our students tonight? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think two parts. Um, number one, I, I would probably, if, if I were to give anybody advice, um, I would I would spend a, a lot more time on learning the business of psychology, and if I say the business, um, you know Lloyd touched on it as well. Um, you know how, how do you manage your finances? Where where does your marketing money go? Um, you know you, you guys are also living in a world of social media, um, and and I see a lot of people out there, and and, and I know that doesn't include anybody, uh, but but the mental coaches that do a, a six month. A life coaching course and all of a sudden they they're a, an, an expert on on performance psychology you know pe people you you guys deal with social media all the time you know learning i've, I've i wrote some notes down here um, and i said the the supporting skills of psychology you know because we we get taught fortunately in this country um other than the sports psychology side of it we get taught well from a psychology perspective but I don't think everybody knows the, the business of psychology. And, and I think that's where a lot of people run, run afoul. And I mean, we, we were, to cast my memory back, I think we were 13 people in my master's year. And I think there's only about three or four people still practicing. And, and I think I'm the only one working in the sports, in the sports side. Um, and, and I can promise you there were some very, very good therapists in, in that group. So, so I think if, if you can learn more of the business side of it, and then simply put, uh, if, if I were to go into one thing right now, that would be neuropsychology um, and understand, understanding the brain better. You know, I, 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 tease, I tease all the athletes that I work with and I say, you know, we, we're, sending, we're sending pods to Mars and we're trying to see where the next big black hole is, but, but we haven't even gone inside deep enough to understand the brain well enough. And, and a lot of performance is, is obviously, if not all, all of it is brain related. Um, so if, if I were to do it over, I'd probably um, do a lot more from, from a neuro 
a psych perspective, understand the brain a lot better because now at 43, I've got to start learning those things again and, and kind of dust off my, my neuropsychology books. Um, but, but those would probably be the two pieces of advice that if, if I were to do it over again, I'd make those my focus points. Okay, great. So I'll definitely list of degrees that I need to get so that I get the business side done. But um, I think that is probably all questions that I have now because we are a little bit time restricted. So sure. what I what I want to do now is open the floor to everyone, Mr. Bemelman, Dr. Fuyun, and Mr. Besaida. No, it's like you are not lim limited to stay muted. And then students, this is your time now to speak. Um, so if you about sports psychology, the field, the experiences, if you want to hear a funny story about, I don't know, the, the canoeing or the golfing, by all means, now's your time to ask. There is an option where you can raise your hand if you want to unmute yourself, or there's the chat box. You can throw your questions in there and then whoever can answer it will answer it. Please not all at once. I'll ask a question. Thank uh, my one's directed Mr. Sorry, Basi. Uh, Mr. Bemelman, what advice would you give to a South African student hoping to study overseas? Like what should they get in order? Like what do they really need? Uh, they, need they need a lot of money. It's very <laughs> 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 American universities are far more expensive uh, all, all over America, Europe. They're far more expensive than ours are. Mm. Um, uh, so I would say save before, start working, and I'd say that money is certainly very important. Yeah, I, I can vouch for that. I was making plans to go and study in Ireland as well. But good gracious, those international fees, if you don't have a passport, they are like through mm -hmm. the roof. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But I mean, there's always bursaries. You can always. Yeah. Work hard for a bursary. There's quite a few available, especially for South Africans because we're a developing country. Yeah, yeah, they, they are. I think that's, you know, what is business you know there, there's a lot of business opportunities for people that do well and uh, the the local PSL soccer league the the guys are it's very cutthroat at the moment I'm sure everyone's seen that the Kaiser Chiefs coach just got sacked so mm -hmm. um, you know it's it's sports is certainly business and if you can help a team do better then you you're not only like getting the team to do to do well but you're actually like cementing your, your place in the team and they you're actually paying for yourself to be there so if you can uh, assist someone else to earn a higher salary a tennis player to uh, climb up the tiers of the ranks then you you're going to afford them more money and you're going to allow them to afford your services so um going going overseas and and doing that it's you know effectiveness brings a, a lot of reward mm. yeah no definitely um so there's no questions in the chat box i'll ask another question by all uh, means mr Poseidano, do you mention that you would like to start dusting off your neuropsychology books do you think well, would you recommend us who are not at your stage yet to like actually go into neuropsychology before venturing into sports psychology? So that's a very it's a very good question. I, I think the the qualification uh, tree or pyramid this um, dis disqualifies you from doing the the sports psychology before you do the neuropsychology. So you would have seen. Uh, with the tax requirements, I, I would probably have gone because you can you can always do the neuro, and then branch out into sport. You know, and that that's that's the catch twenty two that we sit with in this country. Um, others, as Doc said, you know, it's it's 30, 30 or forty percent of his practice. It's it's a hundred percent of my practice, and from what Lloyd said, I think it's pretty much a hundred percent of his practice as well. 
but there's there's a small little issue of I, I can't use my business card and say Theo Besaid, no sports psychologist. That is that is un, unethical and against the the marketing guidelines of the Health Professions Council of South Africa. I have to say counselling psychologist, and and I can put like Morgan said in brackets at the back. I can say specialising in sport. Um, so so if 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 you if you want to do with it, and and a lot of people branch into it. I mean we we know of industrial psychologists. That that moonlight the sports psychologist, um, you know they they have not not all people uh, follow the, the the ethical path like like the gentleman with me on this on this call, um, but I, I would I would look definitely look into and I'm and please I'm I'm not that okay with all the requirements and everything, but if if I were to do it I'd I would go the neuropsychology route. I, I did make a note as well and and I said and and I, I worked in sport as a as a team manager uh, so did so did Kreiling. Um, I mean, Lloyd alluded to the fact that, that he worked at, at, a, at a school in sport. So I would work in sport and do some, some branch of psychology that can open up that, that route for me. Um, you know, that, that, that I would definitely do. Um, but but in, in, in terms of a, of a general interest field and, and how that is booming in, in golf in particular, I mean, we, we've got a product uh, that, that we do uh, neuropsychology work with now. Uh, there, there are so many performance uh, neuropsychology performance related products out there. Not, not all of them are, are great and some of them are uh, very pie in the sky and, and I'd be careful of what, what I use and, and how I use them. Um, but, but from that perspective, I, I, I would do the neuropsych and you can always, um, like, like Lloyd, uh, who I think Dr. Kraling uh, alluded to, you know, a, a lot of people overseas don't just do the one, the one M or, or the one degree. You know they'll they'll have multiple qualifications, and and if you want to stand in a career where you can work from, uh, I only started late. I I started working at 30, um, but if you're looking at a retirement age of 70, 75, I mean it's 45 45 years. You're gonna to have to sharpen your skills every five to ten years. Um, so so yeah, so I, I definitely I'd look at the neuro as a strong foundation, and then branching branching into sport if, if that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. OK, so I don't know if anyone else is dying to ask this question, but I'd love to know. So. Have you guys worked with any stereotypical famous people who, who we would think is famous, not who you would think is famous? Anything like that, South African related or overseas, anything like that, or like anyone doing something cool see see this is now again the bind yeah because if ethically we're not allowed to say oh shit yeah i forgot about that <laughs> okay so let's just pretend morgan didn't ask that very unethical question <laughs> no but I that's mean, but, but, like, see, but, was, but morgan you know, <laughs> but that that's a that's a very practical example you know, yeah. we, we all can refer to people that we've helped to be very successful that are in the national spotlight, that are doing fantastic things out there, which would be fantastic advertising for all three of us sitting here. Um, and so which, which way which way do you go? And that, that's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Doc. No, no, yes, yeah, no, you, you're 100% right there, Theo, so we can't talk about it, but they, um, I, I, I can say, you, you know, maybe the others have also we've been into, I've been in a situation where you've been phoned by the press and wanted comments from you on particular cases, and they know that you've seen the person, but you mm -hmm. can't say I have or I haven't, so we, I've, I've definitely been in those situations, but I think interesting, interesting people, those for sure I've met. And it's and it's often from from um, um, not necessarily famous, but really interesting people and in what they do. And um, uh, and it's not only in sport, but working with with uh, musicians and and uh, performing artists and and it's um, uh, you know people that do. Um, uh, that you you I'm, I'm often find myself in awe of the people I work with and and it's not necessarily the Olympians and the gold medalists mm. but have the, the, developed a skill and uh, you know like that polo cross team I mentioned it's it's an incredible sport you have live equipment on the one hand your horse 
and you have the, the lacrosse racket and it's and the speed and the decision making and the skills that they that they have you know and it's a small sport very few people know really about what is polo what is polo cross um yeah so interesting people for for sure okay well that I am very glad to hear that you all stick to your ethical boundaries. <laughs> I honestly, that slipped my mind. And I think there's a lot of people that probably thought of this question and they were like, mm, what, what, what is going on? But I think that's very interesting. So I don't know if you could answer this, but are you, you're obvious with giving out the personal information but do you have the instance where people make you sign NDAs or do they just with the confidentiality contract that they sign with you obviously does that institute the the NDA or is that something we can't disclose either no doc if you want to you want to go we, well, um, in in my case, they we we do all sign the new puppy papaya act specifically requires uh, you know that there are very um, specific things and uh, and we've mm -hmm. you know there've been these uh, all those courses to to upgrade your confidentiality information and and so and so they do sign that and that basically means you can't disclose anything. So if I need to disclose anything or discuss even that's what I do even with the coaches then I work mm. through the athlete and and uh, preferably get it in writing I also have many parents parents bring the children and then you have to say them up front mm. okay I'm going to see your child but uh, I can't talk you know we can't have a conversation on the mm. side your child so all those things I think it's pretty important to clear it uh, up, up front um so that they that they know um and if they want you and uh, you know most of the time there's not a problem because you you have to it's it's good to include the coach and also the others that you know the people that are close to the athlete the support uh emotionally support also financial support sometimes sponsors and and, and so on uh but then it's with the consent of the athlete and written consent mm -hmm. yeah okay that's very interesting i think I think that's one of the, I would assume, a very challenging part, I think, for me in one day when I'll be there is how you'll take the most natural thing of us, of humans, where we just so easily can talk to whoever. Nice, but then you don't realize that you're actually crossing all of those boundaries by taking mm -hmm. this information to that person and this, for instance. So it's definitely... I think that humans should normalize. Um, Basi, your hand is up if you want to say something. I do. We are running like very late. So. Uh, we have until half past seven. Okay, great. I, well, I was going to say, question. Morgan, we're only getting started, the three of us. What, what do you mean? I thought, I thought this is just chapter one. Okay. <laughs> Basi. Oh yeah, I have one last question for everyone. I want to know what's the biggest lesson you have all learned in your respective fields and what advice can you give to students from that lesson? Okay, who's going to go? Lloyd, do you want to go or shall I? Um, you you're welcome to to go at it if you would like to. We'll go. We'll I, go I with seniority, so. Doc. Okay, great, good. Thank you, Basi. The um, I'm not sure if it's that necessarily the biggest lesson, but it's definitely a lesson that I've learned and I've mentioned it in my talk, is to is to start with what the athlete brings or what they come with. You know, when you when you uh, fresh out of varsity and you have the theoretical knowledge, and then you 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 um, you want to you want to be that you know almost like the teacher and and uh, um, uh, but if you if you the 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 first step is to listen uh, and and uh, you know what is the experience now. 
sometimes they would say, uh, yeah, I always lose concentration. It may not be exactly, but you have to then take that as your point of departure and, and then work from there. You know, maybe it's not necessarily that they do lose concentration. Maybe it's a other. It's it's another problem that they just call. Uh, they always lose concentration in the second round, or, or you know, when it comes to the semis or whatever. But uh, yeah, I, that's that's one of our biggest lessons. And I actually can remember the incident because the client didn't come back, and he he, he was at that stage quite a famous musician. So I was quite um, you know. Um, what was it? I was more than sad that I that he didn't come back. <coughs> there we go. Okay, Theo, you... <laughs> you still you still preparing there, Lloyd? Um, yeah. Yeah, Morgan. I, from from my perspective, I I, I think the the fact that you're your resolve and your resilience in terms of, of wanting to go down this path, whether you call it sports psychology or performance psychology, is, is going to get tested. It's, it's going to get tested a lot. Um, you know, and, and there's always the, the, um, the temptation to, to, to do the unethical thing. Um, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a small example. When, when I um, qualified with my, with my master's, um, you know, and then as all of our students believe, when, when you finish, you know, and, and Lloyd alluded to it as well, when, when you finish, you know, people are going to come knocking on your door and there's going to be a job for you with uh, hundreds of thousands of rands or whatever. And for, for six months after I qualified, I was, I was jobless. I always joke and I say that the most unemployed I've been was the, was, was the six months after I qualified. But, but regardless, and, and in that time, um, I got an opportunity to take over uh, Dr. Cheryl, Dr. Cheryl Calder. Uh, she's a very well-known eye specialist that worked with uh, the Springboks and, and the English rugby team. She actually opened up a practice here at the High, um, at the high Performance Centre, and I got the opportunity to to take that over. Obviously, not in a in a field that I had any expertise in, but I was desperate because I, I didn't have money to buy food. And and I chatted to to my professor, Professor Lawrence Iman, and I said to him, you know, what what is his opinion? And, and his, his advice has stuck with me for a very, very long time. And he said, you know, Theo, your, your biggest problem is that you, you're always trying to look for all the armor when one arrow will do. And, and all he was basically trying to say is, you know, instead of trying to look at all the avenues and all the things that you can get involved in, stick, stick to one thing. In this case, it was psychology. And later, fortunately enough, it branched out into sports psychology for me. Um, but but that that to me was probably the standout lesson. Um, and and if you are serious about this, and if you do want to take this further, uh, that resolve and that focus is going to get tested. But but like athletes, you you have to stay the course and you have to commit. Um, mm. And yeah, so I, I always go back to all the armor versus one arrow. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I think I think that. Um, you know, there's there's largely uh, finishing your your degree and having granted your qualification after having worked so hard and for so many years and uh, finally be, being qualified and now you've you've got all of the the theoretical knowledge um, and you know to do masters you'll you'll have to do a bit of research and you'll you'll be the an incredibly effective person in in possibly one field of study, um, but you know you you would have had access and exposure to a lot of other things as well. So you you'll know a lot, but you know I think the the common um, denominator among a lot of successful people is they they carry on learning. Is um, that yeah they carry on learning and you know the the ability for us to be able to apply the theoretical knowledge to the people that remains like a very challenging thing and it's a it's a very fine line that uh, you you have to find and you have to find it in the most appropriate way to to see what exactly they need and how you need to communicate it because the the client doesn't understand psychology that they 
they're not well versed in it. They don't know why, why they're making the mistakes they're making. And often they don't want to change. They, they, it's very difficult to change and it's, it's hard. You know, um, people are creatures of habit. So if, if you're able to, to come across, meet them where they are and apply the, the knowledge in a practical way that can suit them and is at their level, then you'll, uh, to, the, to, the, to the students listening, you'll be an incredibly effective person. And um, you'll, if you can find that match, that's, I'd say that's a, an incredibly good way to go about it. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I see there's no questions in the chat box, so I think we can um, say goodnight. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming through each one of you. It was definitely very insightful. We all learned quite a lot tonight about the field experience wise, factual wise. So it was very, very insightful. And thank you professionals for like taking time out of your busy schedules and coming through. We really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so if there is okay. nothing else, I'm pretty sure we can conclude. Thank, thank you so much for putting everything up. Thank you very much for having us. Cheers, gentlemen. Have a good evening. Nice to meet you guys. Same to you. Cheers, Doc. <laughs> well,